Hi everyone, uh, this is Matthew Linton from the Council of Graduate Schools, and I'm delighted to welcome you to uh, today's webinar, Best Practices and Success Stories in Graduate Level Online Learning. This webinar is sponsored by Discovery Education. Before we get going with the presentation for today, uh, just a couple of technical support notes. So a reminder that the webinar recording and the slides will be emailed to participants as well as posted on the CGS website. We usually try to turn that around within about a week of the live event. You can also submit questions through the GoToWebinar control panel. You can do that throughout the presentations, though we will be answering those questions during the designated question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. We do uh, recommend that you list the specific presenter you would like to answer the question that you're asking, um, if at all possible. And if you have any sort of technical problems, troubleshooting help is available uh, at the link below. Um, the most common problem that we run into with the GoToWebinar platform um, are issues with audio. So if you're having trouble hearing us, you can try switching to a different audio connection, um, toggling between telephone to mic and speakers or vice versa without leaving the session. These are usually due to bandwidth issues. If you're experiencing persistent problems with the telephone connection, you can click problem dialing in for an alternate phone number to dial. And so with that, I'd like to uh, pass the presentation along to President Suzanne Ortega. Suzanne? Thanks so much, Matt. And good afternoon, colleagues. Um, I think it's good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Um, welcome, and we're so glad to have everyone with us. Um, there's been an enormous amount of interest in the, this webinar and today's topic. I think as we have moved past simply having the technology in place to actually interact with students and to make the mechanics work, we really realize that both as an immediate response to COVID, but what I have come to call its long tail, we need to really think carefully, not just about actually be a, being able to connect via technology, but what are the best practices for developing rigorous and engaging graduate level online courses? So we're hugely pleased to collaborate with Discovery Education to focus on precisely that issue today. Um, and I'd very much like to thank them for both their content and programmatic expertise, but their financial support of this webinar as well. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn the program over to Suzanne Thompson, who is the Managing Director of University Partnerships for Discovery Education. Um, and Suzanne's going to facilitate today's discussion. She is an expert in organizational leadership, academic literacy, curriculum development, and professional learning. Um, Suzanne has deep experience as a teacher as an educational consultant and as superintendent of schools for Northwestern Lehigh School District in Pennsylvania. Sorry, I had to read that part. I was gonna mess it up. <laughs> in her current role, she oversees all aspects of Discovery Education University business and her goal is to support Discovery Education's higher education partners at the graduate level as they work hard to integrate digital curricular programming technology and effective, highlight effective online instruction. So without further ado, Suzanne, I turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Many thanks, Suzanne, for that incredibly warm welcome. On behalf of everyone at Discovery Education, we are truly honored to be members of this fine organization. I will echo Suzanne's sentiments of welcome and hello, good morning and good afternoon to all of our colleagues who have given so generously of their time to have joined our webinar this afternoon. I'm incredibly honored to be here with three of our university partners and three just incredible educators and incredible colleagues, um, Julie, Rhonda, and Lucas, thrilled for them uh, to share some best practices, some success stories, some lessons learned. I think given this era of COVID-19, we are all struggling with a number of new variables that have impacted our organization. And I'm incredibly proud of the opportunity to come together as educators, academicians, many of us have expertise and um, lots of experience 
teaching in an online environment. So I'm thrilled to create this conversation today and this rich dialogue in which we can collaborate, learn from each other, and hopefully contribute to some positivity in everybody's world right now. So with that, um, I'm going to give just a little bit of context for discovery education for those of you who may be new to discovery education on the line today. And we are working hard, as Suzanne said, um, to work with a number of universities in the United States and beyond to really establish a network of partners who are collaborating together. Currently in the world, we are, as Discovery Education, working with states, school systems, ministries of education, entire countries all around the world. We have the pleasure of working with uh, a little over four and a half million educators throughout the globe to provide really high quality uh, digital content. And I love the way Suzanne Ortega uh, talked a little bit about the importance of rigor um, and high quality um, and ensuring that that content is relevant, innovative. Uh, so we are, are very blessed at Discovery Education to work with incredible educators. And those are gonna be in the P12 space as well as the higher education and the graduate space around the world. And next slide. You may be familiar with uh, some of our, our products and services, depending upon where you're located in the US or outside the US. Uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see a real quick snapshot of our graduate course catalog. Uh, the courses in our catalog are continuously growing, and we're really proud to ensure that all of the content in those courses reflect a tremendous marketplace of ideas. So while many of Discovery Education's resources are built into those courses, whether it's uh, topics from Science Tech Book or high quality lessons from STEM Connect or, or anything that's on our experience platform, which is our, our global platform with, with, which covers digital content for K-12 educators all around the world, that those those resources are built into our course catalog but also into all of our courses our standards of learning content from all around the world and tremendous content partners to ensure that there's a level of innovation and rigor associated with all those courses so i'm excited that julie and rhonda and lucas are using content and courses from from this catalog um, to supplement the incredible work they already do in in their degree programs and their uh, colleges of education um, and terribly grateful to them for their incredible feedback that helps continue to inform our work too, which is, I, I think, in essence, uh, a, a tremendous important part of our partnership. Next slide, please. We are working to establish a network of college and universities because we understand the power of people collaborating and sharing best practices and continuously working on, on honing our craft together. So it's an incredible opportunity to collaborate with like-minded uh, universities uh, throughout the United States and throughout the world too. And next slide. I think something incredibly unique about the partnership that all of our universities have with Discovery Education is that our university partners are making unique decisions on their program type based upon what's important to them and what's important to their state, what's important to their region, what's important to educators or students in their programs. So some of our university partners are creating um, new concentrations, adding to their master's degree, extending their um, existing offerings, whether it's through elective or core courses. Some of our university partners are crafting brand new master's degrees um, in collaboration with our course content. Some are using the course content for micro-credentials or, or specialized areas of concentration or STEM endorsements at the state level. So it's it really open to creativity and, and we're really proud and honored to support that level of creativity for our university partners. Next slide. I think something that is incredibly important to us at Discovery Education is the concept of partnership and the concept of supporting educators wherever they may be in their journey. So as part of the offerings of Discovery Education's Higher Education Network, 
we're doing an extensive amount of marketing on behalf of our university partners. We're ensuring that the subject matter experts writing all of our course contents are truly experts in their field. We're helping to expand the graduate portfolio of offerings for our university partners, and also really ensuring that at the same time, through those graduate offerings, our university partners are able to put resources in the hands of teachers taking these courses that are directly applicable in their classroom. So while there's, there's a tremendous level of rigor and a theoretical application, a pedagogical focus, there's also real solid practical resources that teachers can apply immediately in their classroom. And I think given the tenor of what we're dealing with uh, in with regards to the COVID crisis right now, we know that teachers are hungry for high quality digital instructional resources that they can instantly turn around into their lesson planning process or share with colleagues right now. So that is, is proving to be a, a really prized um, resource at this particular moment. And ultimately what we're working to help our university partners to, to do is, is drive enrollment and continue to spread the important work that they're already doing. Next slide, please. And now is my complete honor to introduce you one of our panelists today, and that is Dr. Rhonda Rabbit. Uh, she is the Dean of the School of Education at Wilkes University, and at Discovery Education, we've had the privilege of partnering with Wilkes for almost 50 years, 15 years, one five. Um, so I'm thrilled to introduce Rhonda to you, um, and Rhonda, let me turn it over to you at this moment. Thank you, Suzanne. And one of the things that I would say any leader knows is you surround yourself with great people in order to be successful. And in meeting Suzanne and working with Suzanne, I gotta tell you, I have not met somebody who is more passionate or energetic about education than Suzanne. So she keeps us flying in the time that we've been together already. So I am, as she said, the Dean, thank you for the welcome. And I came intentionally to Wilkes University about five years ago because I felt they would be a good fit for my passion, my purpose, and my belief in partnerships. Not a lot of higher ed institutions were uh, very favorable in partnering with other institutions or organizations to deliver programs at that time. So I thought that was a good fit. Also, I found at Wilkes University a strong commitment to the community, which was also important to me, that we are about empowering teachers, but we're also about giving back to our local communities. But in the School of Education, we offer programs at the undergrad, master's, and doctoral level. So we are actually on a mission to empower educators at every level of the school system to affect change for children, both locally and globally. And personally, my, my mission became very strong once I became a parent of four children and having them go through school. I was like, every child needs to be seen in the classroom. Every child needs to have their needs met because they all have potential. And it's the teachers who can make the difference if they reach that potential or not. Next slide, please. So when I came to Wilkes, the first thing I had to do was do a, an audit of the current existing programs and partnerships. So I was on a mission of unity and quality. And that is again, unity and quality. And we lost some partners, we lost some programs, but Discovery Education rose to the top because they demonstrated true collaboration. We worked like this together to design the program. We worked like this together when checking the curriculum to see if it was current and relevant, if our assessments needed to be updated. We worked like this when we talked about going out into the field and trying to bring people into the programs. So it was not like this and saying we were collaborating. We really were one unit and that set them apart in fact, they got recognized by the president of Wilkes University a couple of years ago as being one of our business partners of the year because of that true demonstration of partnership. So to show you some other numbers about Wilkes University. So I chose, I said, Wilkes in particular and intentionally, the School of Education because they demonstrated to me, they knew what it was like to be in the online environment. I was not an early adopter. I was one of those face-to-face -face instructors who felt I have to be with the child to truly make an impact. But the doctoral program in particular had demonstrated true relationship in an online environment way before the time of COVID. Hmm. Our master's level, 
for two decades now has been doing online programming. So I felt very comfortable coming into an environment that was already well established and well known. You can see the $15,000 master's degrees, bachelor's. So a lot of those are our master's degree teachers. We have an IM degree with Discovery and a STEM endorsement. So I am on a plug in particular for any educator who will listen to me. And I learned this term from Discovery Education. STEM is not just boxing our curriculum into a different format and pushing it out. It is not to be corporatized and marginalized by the marketing industry to say it's all about careers and buy these packages of STEM kits and you can be engineers in the future. It is students and teachers engaging minds. It is for all students in all classrooms because it's really another form of this. It's integrating your teaching and learning. There's a question to be solved and you're gonna pull on all those disciplines to solve the answer. So again, the fact that Discovery Education used that definition, I was a convert, definitely, definitely. Let's do this online STEM endorsement. In fact, now I'm using partnership in another way. I should move to the next slide, please. Next slide. Did I need to go back? Did you intentionally jump over that? Thank you. So instructional media was the, the degree program and then the STEM endorsement. I said, superintendents, a lot of school districts are wanting to become STEM based. They want a STEM building. They want the district to be seen as a STEM innovative leader, but they didn't have an intentional plan to do that. So I sat down in conversation, I said, we have a STEM endorsement that can help you get to that STEM quality that you're looking for across your institution. So we have literally partnered with school districts to work in the STEM delivery over the course of one academic year, one calendar year. And with the thanks of Discovery Education, having a special ceremony to recognize their achievement and the changes that they're making for learning in their schools, as well as um, the joy of learning again in the classroom. So next slide, please. So I think I've already covered a lot of this in, in my talk about the innovation through collaboration. Um, I am just so excited to be here and I feel we are on a cusp of change in the world. Everything is changing, systems are changing, and this is our time for empowering leaders who truly wanna be part of that change to come together to make the world a better place. And I'm proud to be here and part of that mission for that work. Thank you. Rhonda, thank you so much for that incredibly um, generous compliment too. <laughs> I appreciate that tremendously. And, and as we get into the dialogue, I think all of our attendees will see um, across Julie and Rhonda and Lucas, the incredible innovations that they're doing with their online graduate programming and how that is being perceived as very valuable for the students attending as well. So uh, next slide, I am thrilled to turn the conversation over to another one of our panelists. This is Dr. Julie McIntosh. She is also the Dean of the College of Education at the University of Finley. And with that, Julie, I'm thrilled to have you here today. Thank you so much. So um, this first slide, I wanted to just share something personal with all of you. Um, a few things I'm very proud of is I, I've been at the University of Finley for about 17 years and I've been the Dean for 11 years. And one thing that I'm very proud of, obviously we just went through our CAPE accreditation process. So I'm good for another seven years, that's huge. <laughs> and uh, literally just finished on Tuesday. So, um, you know what you build in your program and you try to make things as Rhonda has shared you want to make things as collaborative as possible and you want to make sure that you have a good program and, and one of the ways that I've really been able to even validate that myself is if you notice the picture on the left this is my daughter uh, she actually went through our undergraduate education program and then went into our online master's program and completed her master's this summer so I have first-hand knowledge of what we've tried to create and then I see her viewpoint of going through that and she teaches social studies uh, as well as her husband which is the person just to the right of her and he also went through our social studies program here at the University of Finley and is a social studies teacher then went through our master's program my husband 
went through our master's program and our HRD, our human resource development strand. So I have seen firsthand uh, the collaborations and those experiences with my own family. And then just dealing with COVID, I saw a whole nother side of my students because you start to see in their homes and you see their pets and you see their children. <laughs> and uh, We decided, oh, you know, our dog uh, passed away last year. We need to get a puppy in the middle of the uh, pandemic. So uh, that's Reagan, that's our, uh, puppy and I do not know that I want to relive those two months of puppy training but it's uh, brought much joy to our lives so um, next slide please at the University of Finley I know that uh, today's focus is on graduate level but obviously we offer undergraduate licensure we also offer licensure at the graduate level and most of that most of the coursework in those initial licensure programs would be face to face but our graduate level online learning, we have been offering online since the mid 1990s. So we were at the point where we felt we were cutting edge uh, at the University of Finley because we were one of the first to jump on board with online teaching. And in the College of Education, all of our graduate courses are offered completely online. So we offer a master's program, principal and superintendent licensure, endorsements that can be added to licensure, our doctoral program and then most recently an edd and school psychology is all offered completely online and one of the things that's helped us with quality is to align all of our courses to the quality matters uh, standards so we made sure that the framework that we set up with our courses followed quality matters so then as students are taking graduate courses the look of the course looks the same they know where to go first it, it takes away some of those tech pieces that might get a little tricky and then for the doctoral program we have taken all the courses through there and that program is completely qm uh, certified next slide please some of the distinctions we've received, uh, we have been named, in, as many other universities have, U.S. News and World Report Best Online Graduate Education Programs. We also received a Best Online Master's in Science Education, and then uh, also noted on Best Online Doctorate in Education through Intelligent.com. So looking at our strengths and what we were doing well, we also wanted to partner, as Rhonda just shared, many schools in Ohio want that STEM or STEAM designation as a school. We were hearing from teachers, I want to learn how to integrate those um, creative, collaborative, uh, problem-based learning projects into my classroom. So our, we actually have a museum here on campus called the Mazza Museum. It was started by the College of Education and it includes art from children's picture books. And we recently, um, so we have, I think, close to 15,000 works of art in that Mazza Museum. And we also started a paper engineering room that uh, talks about paper engineering. We do workshops on that. But the thing that we're excited about is that picture that you see just to the right of the Mazza Museum logo. We're adding a STEAM addition to the Mazza Museum that will be a museum completely focused on STEAM. And we thought that was a good time for us to restructure one of our emphasis areas in our Master of Arts in Education. And we partnered with Discovery Education for that new Master of Arts in Education with an emphasis in STEAM instruction. So at this point, the state of Ohio does not offer an endorsement or any type of add-on with STEAM designation. So this is new for us to start something like this. And we found that teachers, especially in COVID, are just being bombarded with resources and they don't have the time to go through all of those. So for us to partner with Discovery Ed and they're learning to use those resources in their classroom, they are e easily able to transition and use that in their K-12 setting. So we have found that it's been a fabulous partnership in that way and a great high quality digital content resource from Discovery Education. So next slide. Based on the title of our presentation, one thing I did want to share with you, um, besides doing the Quality Matters alignment, we do require any of our faculty members that teach an online course, especially at the graduate level, that they take a course on online course design, delivery, and instruction. So it gives them a chance to be a student in an online perspective so they see what it's like to, to be in that role. There's a backward design perspective on course setup. They help develop authentic assessments in the, that class, design effective and engaging discussions, and then create cohesive online modules and lessons so that when they're creating their course content, they're using the best practices that are out there. So our um, assistant 
vice president actually teaches that class, uh, our assistant vice president of online instruction, and he does a great job with that class, and those are the objectives of that course. Julie, thank you so much for that fantastic overview. Tremendously appreciated. And last but definitely not least, I'm thrilled to be introducing uh, Dr. Lucas DeWitt. Uh, Lucas is the Director of Graduate Programs, oversees the Teacher Leadership uh, Curriculum and Instruction Group, um, and, and specializes in the area of specialization as special education as well. And Lucas, um, and I have had lots of great conversations uh, because we both share long backgrounds as K-12 educators as well too, and are thrilled to be able to be collaborating to bridge the importance of collaborating between our degree programs and our university environment and, and, and to support the great work that teachers are doing in schools all around this country right now. So with that, I'll turn things over to Lucas. Thank you, Suzanne. You know, it's nice to be here and talk to you. Buena Vista University is uh, located in Northwest Iowa and I'm overseeing the graduate programs on teacher leadership curriculum instruction, special education. And we've been online since early 2000s. Um, had to make some major adjustments as time has gone as well as everybody has. And I think the pandemic more than anything has, has helped us all realize that even though we felt like we had things going the right direction, uh, we feel like things are, are, are going pretty well, something always changes and you're always constantly looking for ways to improve and get better. And I think the pandemic, from what we've seen in our university and, and with the influx of teachers' interest is they want to get better, they want to perform better, they want to know the newest ways to do things. Uh, I think that the pandemic pushed virtual instruction uh, 15 years faster than anybody anticipated it coming. We've been talking about this going this way for a long time. And now all of a sudden when there's no longer kids in a K-12 classroom, uh, teachers had to figure out real quick how to make things happen. And they're leaning on universities, any outside agency, anything to, to get better at the craft. Next slide, please. In uh, this past year, we've been with, partnered with Discovery for the last two years, and that was prior to the pandemic, obviously. And the track that we were looking on was a teacher technology integrationist position as part of our master's program. And so we're trying to help teachers to already move to a more remote or virtual hybrid type instruction. And then when the pandemic hit, um, all of a sudden we were already in place and it, it created quite, quite a bit of interest of teachers wanting to get better in that, in that area. And so we, we offer uh, eight week classes is how we go at all of our, our programs fully online. And I think one thing that we've found has been really beneficial is, is we offer asynchronous classes for our programs, but we also offer a class component. And so we advertise and we say, and it's important that we are fully online, um, but we do offer some voluntary classes um, throughout the courses for teachers to join in, to get additional insight, and to run class for those that are wanting the face-to-face -face relationship in addition to, um, you know, their normal online setting. Everybody learns differently, and there and we found a lot of teachers that really, really just want to connect, um, and and just having that as an option, it, it has been very helpful, and, and we've received really good feedback that way. Um, one key point that we figured, and and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, is that relationships matter so much in an online environment as well. That, that, that you're still craving those connections, you're still this craving interaction, you're wanting to collaborate, you're wanting to talk. And so it's so important that your instructors have been trained in how to do that and how to make those connections. And really your instruction so much from your online is the delicate, deliberate and distinct feedback that you're providing to your students. So much learning happens through there and that's where really a lot of your teaching happens. And so that's just a key piece is to make sure that that feedback is there and that you're honoring relationships, setting up sessions to meet with your, with your students one-on-one -on -one if need be or in groups as well. Um, for those that need it is just an additional piece that adds to the relationship piece. Next slide, please. One thing I made note of is that it's been interesting is in the last year, our enrollments have really increased. And we think that that's primarily because of our online focus and being reactive to, to the needs of the teachers in, in, in our area. Um, also, it's been the result of our board that made a, a distinct dis decision in the times of everybody's enrollments are fluctuating, everybody's fighting for students, uh, everybody's wanting to, to stay, stay ahead of the game as they said, you know what, we need to make our, our educational program at the graduate level for teachers to be affordable. Um, and so we need to do some things to make some changes so that, that we can show we're committed to education. And Buena Vista is the, is the biggest producer of, of teachers, undergrad teachers in the state of Iowa outside of the three public schools. 
So we do have quite a foothold in different areas. Uh, part of that is because um, back in the in the 70s and the 80s, we had uh, network centers set up through all a lot of the community colleges in Iowa, where we tried to go into small towns and provide college in a rural setting um, before online was even in place. And they had the, the Iowa ICN, Iowa Connection Network, which was old video and a lot of money spent for, for wiring uh, to allow that to happen. And then it moved into face-to-face -face, and then it moved into fully online. And so to continue to support those teachers, they said, if, if we're going to be online, we need to make it cost effective for teachers to, to join us and to move towards their graduate degree. And so that's been one of the ways that we've been able to increase our enrollment, as well as we found that during the pandemic in March, when teachers uh, all of a sudden were forced to, to go home, they were looking for courses or looking for a way to stay connected. And through that, it was amazing to me, as I never would have guessed, we had more interest than we had previously as a result of that and and that has forced us to continue to evolve as well as as now looking at each of our modules and how we're teaching to determine you know how do we show them how to be uh, more responsive in an online environment than we would have before it's become a major focus on our curriculum because that's what's changed and that's what's necessary so i appreciate this time to talk to you a little bit about uh about what we're doing at bv and just to be a part of this dialogue thank you Thank you so much, Lucas and Rhonda and Julie, for great opportunities to introduce and give some context. I definitely encourage participants to use the, the question feature and feel free to add some questions. And there are questions pouring in. So I'm thrilled we're at this part of the dialogue today. Don't hesitate to be shy and ask lots of questions. Julie, the first question is, uh, aimed towards you and it says julie does your university require all faculty regardless of their prior experience in online course design and teaching to complete training we require anybody who teaches online to complete that training however i will say we had to uh, bump that training up quite a bit when COVID hit in march because we went remote as many other universities went remote so for our college of education most of our faculty teach online and face-to-face -face. so that their lift wasn't as much to move to an online setting other colleges across campus there were some professors who had never taught in an online setting so they did go through the training very quickly so i would say a majority of the faculty at the university have been through that training now but required no thank you so much julie rhonda i know the question wasn't directed at me but i, I think it's it would be um good to know that that is a common thing i believe across the universities because we also have our own online requirement for anybody who is going to teach we have a number of adjuncts who come to teach for us, so that is a good way for them to get oriented to the Wilkes way, as well as get any professional development in how to teach effectively online. Lucas, any thoughts relevant um, to that question from your perspective? I think it's it's just so important to understand that training does matter. <laughs> um, and for so many, it, it's until you've gone through it and practiced it, um, it's tough to, to describe um, how, to, how to even function fully. I think one thing that gets lost, and, and I think a lot of people figured out over time, is that you can't just take your face-to-face -face class and just say you're up and running. Um, so much of being success is design. Your whole design matters, and it, it takes time, and it takes a lot of energy to get it designed correctly. That's the only way you can have an effective class. So um, building on that, I've just really felt for a lot of our, our K-12 teachers that that went so fast to a remote setting and, and we're teaching multiple subjects and multiple preps and okay we're going remote tomorrow um have everything up and running which leads to a whole different issue that's not the point today but i do worry about the mental health of a lot of our, our teachers as well as a is our faculty um, just because there's been such a big change in how they're designing that without the confidence um, and the training um, and the time to put something up to speed how you want it to be delivered can be very taxing Great points from all three of you. And I, I know that I want any one of our university partners to also be able to lean on the expertise at Discovery Education for e-instructional design or, or what does high quality engagement look like when you're in an online environment. To Lucas's good point, teaching in person is really different than teaching effectively in an online environment. And that's something we're really proud uh, to be able to do is support our university partners, whether it's through 
innovation in engagement or looking at different kinds of tools. I'm happy to help anybody um, who's a member um, who wants to reach out with any questions in, in that regards as well. And that takes me to the next question, and I may pop between the three of you on this one as well. Um, Lucas, I'll start with you. How can online instructors become aware of the various technological tools that are available to enhance online learning? Yeah, that, that really goes back to training and, it, and it's back to the university to make sure we're providing that training. It's for our adjuncts as well as for our faculty, um, just to make sure that they're up to speed on how to do things and better ways to do things. I think it also brings another side in and that's just the oversight and evaluation of your programming and working with the teachers and, and really checking in with your students more than just your evals that you get back on, on course responses. But um, somebody needs to be in the courses, seeing how they're designed, how they're developed, as well as seeing how feedback's monitored um, and checking in just, just to see what are the next steps. I also think it's really important to, to have an ear on what's going on in, in K-12 and really be aware of what the needs and how fast they're changing, um, you know, with curriculum being condensed, how are we responding to help teachers to do those things. You know, so it's just it's just training is so important to help oversee all of those things. Rhonda, how about from your perspective, when you think about where are how do how do your faculty or, or uh, educators at Wilkes University think about how, how do we become aware of the various technological tools that are available to enhance online learning? Well, I, I have to say, without taking the credit, I, I would say the School of Education has been an innovative leader in that. But to Lucas's point, we now actually have an office of online teaching and learning experts who are instructional designers, who are trainers, who now support all of the faculty. So there is intentional support mm -hmm. for faculty and adjunct alike in that area. But I think a lot of it comes down again to collaboration and communication. So we have um, different mechanisms of coming together where the faculty share like, oh, this is something I just discovered. You gotta try this. Because I think to your point, the plethora it's over opportunity of information and you want to find out kind of like what julie said we build it into the course so they experience the tools of discovery and they don't have to wade through all of those options themselves they, they have the experience they like it and then they use it so our faculty need to have a collaborative team environment to share what they discover that works so that they can then benefit from others thank you and and julie any additional points yeah, I mean, I think all of us probably have those um, academic technology support. We have a Center for Teaching Excellence. So not only is there a course that people can take, there are short professional development opportunities that they can either watch virtually or attend and just learn new strategies. And, and I actually, in our College of Education meetings, I ask different faculty members to share a new technology or new tool that they're using, how they use it in the classroom. And that has been really effective. And I think sometimes we all just get busy and even if you've been through training with whatever LMS platform you use when you go to that initial training you're almost overwhelmed with all the tools so once you're using it oh yes you can video your responses instead of always typing comments back to the students those kind of things just quick reminders quick tools and and I think there's a lot of ways to get that information in small bits yeah, I so appreciate everybody's comments relevant to that question, and it's a fantastic question. Um, I would also put my hand up and, and know that our university partners can rely on Discovery Education as well. I think all of our university partners recently received some correspondence relevant to all kinds of resources and tools and materials and, and topics and things that teachers could grab right away or things that they could um, wrap into their course content. So know that you can count on us as a, as a good partner to provide you with those outlets as well of highly qualified vetted resources uh, that helps. Uh, sometimes you see a little bit of light through the very cloud, clouded and, and very overwhelming space there. Lucas, this next question is directed towards you. How do you ensure that your asynchronous courses are not labeled correspondence courses, which can be problematic for accreditation purposes, particularly since the synchronous portions are not required. The synchronous courses, um, the synchronous part is not required. We build that as an, an option, you know, more or less if anybody wants to show, show up to get additional support, I suppose, to say, I, I wouldn't say we're trying to get around anything. It's a, it's a way of, of setting it up there more or less like, you know, a, 
one-on-one -on -one meeting or a student meeting or just question and answer session around around the dialogue. Uh, so there's no grading that comes out of that. There's there's no assignments that come out of that. Um, it's just further understanding. Um, and we found that to be helpful just to, to offer support for those that, that need that or would like more of that. The NOAA courses that are you know are set up asynchronous, they're set up and fall in line with what's necessary and required. Um, that's just an added bonus. Thank you. And I'm actually going to tap into Rhonda and Julie on this particular question because all three of your organizations are offering asynchronous courses. Very rigorous, you know, at least 45 hours in length with modules, expectations, um, assignments, you know, the producing evidence of, of learning. So let me tap into to Rhonda, let me start with you. Is And the question is, how do you ensure that your asynchronous courses don't end up getting labeled correspondence courses? Yes, yeah, so I did want to echo um, what Lucas said. So we do offer both asynchronous and synchronous. And the relationships first piece, I would say, so whether that's a synchronous orientation to the program, to the course, synchronous advising sessions one-on-one -on -one with your instructor, synchronous actual class meeting time, we're really encouraging more of that because as we have more and more time isolated, that's a way to keep those relationships strong. But for the asynchronous, um, it's again comes back to design and intentionally designing it so that there are uh, checkpoints and interactions. So the teacher has to be engaging regularly with the class. And I say class because it's not an isolated learning experience. When our asynchronous courses are designed, they're designed as collaborative. So you still have the, the scheduled group comment time. You still have the scheduled group activities. So even though it's asynchronous, there is still some collaborative group work. And it's again, intentionally designed by schedule, which again, when you go from the 14 weeks down to seven weeks, like we did, you have to let go of the old model and say, hmm, now how are we gonna have them engaged so that they can demonstrate they've met those outcomes? Thank you so much, Rhonda. And Julie, let me turn to you for your thoughts and input on that question. I would agree. We offer asynchronous courses. So exactly what Rhonda said, we still have intentional engaging activities so that students are interacting with one another, whether that be through a discussion board, open office hours, the faculty member holds. We find that many faculty members end up communicating with our students one on one and actually spend more time and know their students even better than in a face to face class. So um, we don't see a disconnect there. If the question came more from a perspective of how does this uh, asynchronous class equal hours for Higher Learning Commission, which is our accrediting body, our regional accrediting body? We have a form that faculty fill out for every online course that says, what is the objective? What are the modules? What's the time associated with this to complete? So I don't know if that's where that question was coming from, but we have that on file for every single online course. Fantastic. Yes, to Julie's point, I can, that's a very good question about the, the impetus for the question, because I remember my last institution in CAPE accreditation demonstrating the instructional hours, even though you're online asynchronous, and then the homework hours that are distinct from that. So, yes. Same. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for incredible um, input on that particular question. And the, uh, the those asking questions are are saying thank you. And <laughs> they're very appreciative of the information that they are hearing from all of you. Let me pivot to something. I think we're all pretty steeped into the impact of COVID. And I think we're probably inferring that where we have longevity and really high quality online programs already in place. There's probably a, less of an impact, um, and I appreciated that some of our panelists have also talked about some of the positive aspects of learning online as well, rather than simply a reaction to a global pandemic, but as a true forward-thinking learning model that is highly valued by, by many busy adults who are working hard to advance their careers or expand their skill sets. What I'm curious to hear from all three panelists is where do you think higher ed needs to go now? Um, given the impact of COVID, what we're learning about online um, graduate programming, what's what's your thought on, on where we need to go? And uh, Rhonda, I'll start with you. You pick on me first all the time, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll bite, I'll bite. So I believe that that question is actually bigger than the university. 
So when people ask me what I do, I say I'm on a mission to change the school system because I believe, as I stated earlier, that there's too many children that do get missed in the system. And I believe that learning should be fun and we should be engaging our whole human aspect in the teaching and learning. So that is the one thing that I am concerned about. Um, I just this last week had a couple parents in different conversations talk to me about being so fearful for their kids. This one mother, she said, her daughter cannot sit in front of the computer screen. She is not capable. It's not in her DNA to do that. And so she she wants her child to keep learning, but she was really at a loss of what to do. So we have to recognize that completely online is not the answer for all children. So somehow we're going to have to create the new model that doesn't yet exist. So mm -hmm. I believe that online education is a fact of the reality now. It is going to be part of the norm. It's no longer going to be something extra, um, but yet we have to find out how do we still engage children in the humanity and the creativity, the experiential part of that with others. And so I, I believe that in higher ed too, we, we can no longer be seen as the brick and mortar. I'm, we've been talking about that, I think, for a decade now, predicting that the time was going to come. Well, that time has come, and we have to determine, so who do we want to become now? And again, I think we should be working with the PK-12 and see them as a partner in this process and not standing alone on our own to solve our own problem. Rhonda, thank you so much. Let me bounce over question. to uh, Lucas. Yeah, I, I don't think we're going back. Um, I mean, this pushed the issue as far as change that's happening, ready or not, it's here. Um, but I do think that there's going to be a lot of changes throughout preschool through higher ed as far as how college and how teacher prep looks. Um, we're talking about partnerships here. I, I see a lot more partnerships between school districts um, and universities as far as um, who knows what's going to happen. I mean, I see more of a of, of providing class for teacher training within schools, a lot more of that. And and kids coming out of high school that know that they're going to 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 be a teacher that want to get into a school system right away. And and how do the how do the colleges then support that training and the steps in place in many universities to make that happen. I think that's going to be more of the norm. Um, I also think that, that that you're right, Rhonda, when you talk about, you know, online might not be for everybody at every grade, you know, especially look through pre-K through third grade and how important it is, how do we support that? And also, you know, the discussion is going to be around what do we do the last year of, of lost learning for a lot of young kids um, and how does that impact education ac across the board? You know, so the fact of the matter is, is that that if we're not going back, the current teachers that we have are going you know, to want to continue to get better at their craft. So that's going to push for more training and more understanding how to teach virtually, uh, more, more performance on how to do that is going to be is going to be the key thank you lucas and julie <laughs> i think you both have brought up a lot of great points and i i do think there there are places still for that face-to-face um, -face interaction that does need to happen and i think some of our students in particular our undergrads on campus we're so thankful to be back seeing each other so mm -hmm. i do think there's still a, a space for that but we we really started moving our graduate programs if we had some programs that were really resistant to moving online but we could offer a course online or face-to-face -face and everybody would say i want face-to-face -face, but you offer an online class that's the section that would fill up and we couldn't get anybody to take a face-to-face -face class at the graduate level. So I think for a working professional who can budget their time and has good time management skills, they are much more prepared for that online learning environment. And we find that that works really well. Where I see the future going is I'm very interested in looking at kind of these micro credentials and credentialing, because I, I think that's that's kind of where the future is headed is not just you know a master's degree in this, but what are some other credentials and things that you can add to your resume to make you more marketable? I think that's a fantastic point, Julie. And one of the things that I truly value about our collaboration is the uniqueness across all of our organizations and the agility of finding the right solutions for the university as well as the right solutions for all the students attending. Um, I'm curious, um, and one of our, our participants um, 
is commenting as well saying, I think higher ed is going to be using the hybrid model much, much more. And I'm just curious to get a quick reaction um, from Lucas, Rhonda and Julie. And, and Rhonda, I won't start with you first now. I'll start with Lucas first <laughs> to get a quick reaction. And, and Julie made a really interesting point about working adults who are attempting to further their career path or add skills. Um, I had an interesting conversation, um, I think, with Rhonda earlier today about what about those that aren't in their jobs the way they were and needing schooling and some some quality education to expand their skill set. So, so quick reactions on like against the comment. I think higher ed is going to be using the hybrid model much, much more. Lucas, what do you think? A quick reaction is absolutely. Uh, I mean, there, we're not going back, and and for all the reasons that have been said. Um, just the availability um, and people working different times and having access. You know, Julie's comment about courses, you know, face-to-face -face versus online, which is filling up faster. That's not just isolated to her school. That's that's pretty universal of, of, of people that have realized that, yeah, I would love to go face-to-face, -face, but I'm a busy person. And, and now with, you know, sickness concerns, um, it just has gone that much faster route. So yeah, there's there's no question I think we'll be headed that way more and more and more for a lot of reasons. And the other side of it that we haven't even addressed is is the shortage of teachers in in, in schools. And and that that's just going to continue to grow. And we're going to have to be creative as an educational system to recruit more teachers and how does that look and how do we how do we make it more accessible for them. So yeah, I think hybrid definitely is is going to be the norm. Julie I, I would agree. And I think that what we're looking at, I mean, flipped classrooms was such a popular concept a few years ago, and now it's moved more to this high flex model. So I think there are some some professors who are really looking at how do I really use that face to face time the best? And so that they're doing other things kind of in that online setting. But how can I use more engaging techniques when I'm actually with them face to face? So I think that has worked really well. Thank you. And Rhonda. So my reaction would be from a university as a whole, absolutely. But from the School of Education, all of our masters we have now converted to exclusively online. Our doctoral is exclusively online except for a residency when you first come into the program. But because of COVID, we had to convert that to a virtual experience, which the organization and logistical nightmare that they pulled off successfully, I'm in awe of to bring educators international together. Um, but from our undergrad program, uh, I had been pushing actually to go online because I want to be part of the solution for early childhood education. But those child care workers, they can't come to campus for class. They can't afford to come to campus for class. So we did create an alternative online version for them at a reduced rate. And uh, again, faculty were not appreciative of that. But now the reality is we've been grateful to have that as an option because we didn't have to pivot there. We were already there. So, yes. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to take a moment and think a little bit about if you had one bit of wisdom to share with all of our colleagues that are on the line today relevant to your online programming, what would that bit of wisdom be? So I'll give them a moment to reflect um, and just share with all of our um, participants um, that all of the course content that we create at Discovery Education is online asynchronous course content. We build all of our courses in the Canvas platform and then export that content over to whatever platform that our university partners are working on um, and work with just an incredible team of e-instructional designers to make sure that what we're building um, has a, a real um, focus on engagement, high quality engagement that taps into the concepts of relationship and, 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 and rigor um, that, that Julie and, and Rhonda and Lucas uh, talked about today. So with that, let me turn to our three panelists again. And, and Julie, I'll, I'll start with you, your, your bit of wisdom to share. I would say that we need to take away from this whole pandemic look for some positive silver lining of, of what we can take from online and continue to do that well, but also have some grace and empathy for what teachers and professors are going through right now. Great point. Rhonda? One piece of wisdom. I, it sounds cliche and Lucas said we all know it, but I think you have to keep the relationships first, which I think that empathy 
demonstrates that we didn't notice a change in COVID with our online courses, except for the fact that we had to be more empathetic for the teachers in the online courses. And the other piece that was mentioned earlier is make it relevant. Whatever they learn that weekend or in that class, they should implement right away in school the next week. Keep it relevant. Great point. And Lucas. Yeah, I echo Julie and Rhonda. Those are those are great points of wisdom. Um, I I just add to that 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 when you're planning this, your design does matter. I mean, that's that's really key to put the time in and to design it correctly. Um, that's just such an important thing to to keep to keep in perspective when you're crunched for time trying to make things go fast to to be responsive like we need to be. Thank you. Excellent point. Um, a couple reminders for everybody who's on the call today. This session was recorded and um, thankful to my colleagues at the Council for Graduate Schools because next week we will be sending out a follow-up email, we'll be sharing the presentation and we'll be sharing the recording as well. So if anybody missed it, um, you absolutely have the opportunity. Um, we definitely welcome more questions, funnel them to um, CGS and we will happily put together a frequently asked questions document or continue to support all of our colleagues that took the time to join this session today. We're so grateful to you and tremendously grateful to the Council for Graduate Schools for allowing us this opportunity to chat and connect with all of you today. So with that, I'm going to turn things back over to Matt uh, for some closing words. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Uh, Big thank you to uh, to Lucas, Julie, and Rhonda for your uh, excellent perspectives and incredible presentations. And a, a big thanks to Suzanne and the uh, Discovery Education team for their support, as well as uh, an incredible job moderating this discussion today. Mm -hmm. so, so thank you to all the presenters. We do have uh, one event, but it's a big one um, to share a reminder for. Um, that's the Council of Graduate Schools annual meeting. Um, this will be held virtually this year, and it's a big one. It's our 60th anniversary celebration. Um, so if you could join us virtually between December 2nd and December 4th, I uh, will have an incredible uh, list of speakers and presenters to, to share with you all. So thanks again to all the presenters today. Thanks again to Discovery Education. Uh, thank you to the audience for your participation and for joining us. Um, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Stay healthy.